Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament. We uh, are in Psalm 119. We will be here for a little while. Uh, I believe this is week three, and we'll get through two sections of this today. Um, by sections, if you are just joining us for the first time, you'll see that the, uh, the, the psalm itself is broken down into eight individual verses per section. And so each one of those sections begins, actually each verse begins with that letter of the alphabet. So what I'm going to do today, and I've been kind of putting it up for only a little while, but there's really no need. You don't have to look at me for anything. I'm going to uh, keep up on the screen a breakdown of the English versus the Hebrew on this, just so that you can uh, kind of look at it and reference it as we as we read through it. So once again, if this is like the first time that you've been through any of these studies, you can go back and, and uh, listen to all of them. And I've been saying we'll be able to kind of pick up speed a little bit as I don't need to repeat some of the things that I've mentioned in the first couple of weeks. And so um, what I'll do today for the two sections that we'll be covering during the time that I'm going through those eight verses, I'll just leave up on the screen the side by side. And uh, again, I want to thank my, my good friend, uh, Glenn Boyer, who uh, helped put these together, or actually he put them together entirely. And uh, he saved me a ton of work by uh, already doing all this and was kind enough to share them with me. But I just find it very, very interesting that uh, David has put it together this way and, and assembled um, uh, these writings of these psalms, uh, or this psalm, I should say, and the sections that are here. Uh, just think about what a, what a task it would be if we were to do this uh, on a straight across kind of a parallel, if we were to say, we're gonna, we're gonna write something that is going to be uh, our way of expressing our gratitude to God for his word, and then say, I'm gonna do eight verses with the letter A, the letter B, the letter C, all the way through our alphabet, <clears throat> and not have it sound, you know, contrived or, or forced in any way. Um, if we didn't know the construction of this, we could read it like any of his Psalms or, you know, Proverbs, kind of the, the type, same type of a, of a way. If you're going to write something that is uh, uh, constructed in such a way of, of thanking God for the fact that he communicates, and I want to go through that in just a moment here, but the idea of, of David being able to look at the Bible that he would look at. And again, we're, we're thinking pretty much just the Torah, the things that were written and uh, that God is communicating to the nation. Uh, David at the time would have that and uh, and really not a lot else that he could probably reference. But um, what he would definitely have, again, is uh, the uh, five books of the law, which is, you know, Genesis and then Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those five books known as the Torah, um, is what he would more than likely be referencing. You can pretty much tell by the, the way that he describes it. So just the, the construction of it is really kind of brilliant. And uh, I had mentioned this before. We believe that, that anything that's written as far as the scripture is concerned is done by the agency, if you will, or by the leading or the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And yet there's, there's no way to... to uh, uh, miss that there are times that the actual writer, their own personality comes through these things absolutely. Because uh, David, great example of this, when you go through the Psalms, how often he just shares his innermost thoughts and even by, by making reference to things that are troubling to him. So there are Although they're, they're written in such a way that, that uh, are supposed to comfort him as he puts, you know, puts these things down on, on paper or writes them out, at the same time you just see he's kind of going through a lot of personal things. So it's not written like we might see doctrinal things like Paul would do. He's writing down, these are the things that we're supposed to know. This is what's, in, what's important that we understand. David's just kind of pouring out his heart a lot of times and he's writing these things down. But God has preserved those things. So again, the construction of it was it David that just thought, I want to sit down and do this. I want to, I want to write something about my, my thanks to God for writing these things down and communicating to us and the construction of it, you know, eight verses for each letter of the alphabet with a common theme, but a wide ranging way of, of explaining these things. It's just kind of cool. And I, you know, I think believe, I believe obviously it's, it's kind of a cooperative thing. It was on David's heart to do it, led by the Holy Spirit, the wisdom that is found there. 
and uh, and the the glorying in who God is and giving thanks to Him for recording for us the Word. So it's again just really really fascinating. So what I want to do. I want to just read the uh, eight verses, both of the times uh, for the two sections that we do, and I'll change out, you know, those eight verses where we can compare the uh, the English to the um, uh, to the Hebrew. So, let me go ahead and put that up now, and I'll have it there as accompanying as I read these things. And I'm just going to leave it up for the whole time that we actually go through the text. So, when we read in verse 17 is where we pick up today. It says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things through your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, uh, who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So before we actually look at the text, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And we'll make some, you know, kind of observations, I guess you could say, as we start in on this. And uh, just things that we want to kind of keep in the back of our minds as we study through and look at the, a lot of these um, studies that we do. I want to kind of look at, at words that we might use synonymously uh, with some of these uh, ways that he's, he says these things. What do we understand or what do we what do we learn from what he is saying? How would we maybe be, be able to reword them or how do we kind of look at the synonyms of it for a better understanding? So we'll do plenty of that and uh, we'll be doing that all the way through Psalm 119 because it's, it's instructive, it's helpful for us. So let's have a word of prayer and uh, make some observations and we'll look at the text individually. Father, we thank you for the time that we can spend in your word. We thank you that you open our eyes to these things, as David even says here. Uh, it is one thing to just read the, the Bible itself, read your word. Um, as many people I've, I've heard claim that they've read your word and that there's been no result in it. And so we realize it's not just literature on a page. It can be understood. And you have given us uh, your, your promise that the Holy Spirit will lead us in all of these matters. So we pray for that to be the case here today and that you would, again, open our eyes to what we see here, that we would walk in a place of integrity before you and that we would grow in our knowledge of you. We give to you all thanks. We give to you praise and uh, all thanksgiving and uh, ask again that you would lead us and direct us in the study of your word. And we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. All right. One thing I want to point out here real quick before we actually look at the text, you're going to notice, and I just jotted them down for quick reference, but if you look at at the way that David talks about the Word of God, or, you know, he uses a number of different ways. Let me just point them out. In verse 17, he uses God's Word or your Word. In 18, he refers to it as the law or the Torah, those five books I mentioned before. Verse 19, it's commandments. 20, it's judgments. 21, commandments again. 22, testimonies. 23, statutes. 24, testimonies. This is just a variety of ways of being able to not be so redundant of using the exact same term every single time he makes reference to it. Because with the exception of only two verses in this entire um, in this entire psalm, he's going to make reference to somehow the communication of God. So again, in this case, word, law, co- uh, commandments, judgments, go down the list. And there are different ones he also has in the second set that we'll go through today. What I want to, and the reason I bring that up, it's not as though he's, he's saying what he's saying with very specific um, you know, kind of drilling down necessarily on the one that he uses. So if he uses the word law, Torah, does that mean he doesn't mean commandments or testaments or, you know, uh, testimonies rather, or witnesses or whatever other word he may choose to use? It isn't as though you couldn't use any of them and, and use them interchangeably. So then the reason for that, by and large, and I'm sure that there are a couple of examples that none come to mind right now, but examples where Using the word law, let's say Torah, would have a, it's the best word that you could use for what he says. And I'm sure that there are those cases, but I want to make sure that we understand it. This is a psalm that is intended for the person who is reading it 
to just recognize that David in the big picture here is saying about God, the way that you have communicated. So if he used to read those five books of the, of the Bible, uh, the first five books, um, you're going to find that there are times where direct reference is made to the law. These are the things that you must do. These are put down as, again, they're, they're, they're uh, read, written rather in the way that it's a code, almost like what we would consider a penal code. So these are the things that you're required to do. And if you violate them, there is going to be an issue with your violation. There's going to be a cost to that violation. There are other times when he talks about precepts. And so these are principles. These are things that are just, it's wise that a person would do this. So you can, you can find that there's sometimes very minimal variation in topic or term, I should say, of each one of these words. And that's why you could kind of use them interchangeably. So I'm not going to get so caught up in the actual words themselves. So, um, you know, not that's not really majorly the concern. So just the, the big picture of this, remember, as David says these things, these are the assumptions that God not only speaks, but he also uh, hears and he answers prayer. He gives guidance. He gives comfort. You can find that in David's words. And that the person who would seek out God that way, you'll find, as David says, that the reaction that he has because God does all of those things. You'll see him talk about being thankful and blessed and that he has been made whole, that God, that God is healed, whether it's in the physical sense or of the mind, the idea of being favored or accepted, you know, just all of those kind of things. And I'm sure I've left plenty out in that list, but you get the point. And so my, my reason for mentioning all of that, think about how much this separates the God of the Bible from all other beliefs that man has ever had. And the way that God communicates in his word is unique and it's different. So again, the closest that we find in the way of, uh, of some kind of sacred writing, what, it, what the world would call sacred writing, is what you might find within Islam in the Quran. But if you were to, to read even one or two or three or a handful of the surahs, you'll find that the way that, that things are communicated are completely different. And so the idea that, that God would directly speak is it, it, the way that he communicates is different in the, uh, in the Bible versus, say, the Quran. And you can see that it's pretty obvious. The, um, the way of interaction, the idea that God would tell you that he loves you on a personal level, that's very much unique to the God of the Bible. And uh, you get that in both the Old and the New Testament. The idea that sin is, uh, is not only identified, but that there is also a way that man could be reconciled. And uh, the Bible would say that, that uh, or would teach us that no matter where we are at any given point in time, like right now, if I'm thinking about this right here today, as I record this, if I was to ask myself the question, am I right before God? And if I died right now at this moment, do I have the hope of eternity? And I could know for absolutely positively sure that I am saved and that I, I would see God face to face in that moment when I left this life and that there would be no question as to whether or not I would be accepted in him. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. And it, it, the idea that God is, in this, in this sense, personal, again, is very unique to the Bible, that we are told that we have an eternity and that we know what it would look like, that we will be walking among uh, the, the creation of God with him there present. We are in his presence at that time. Again, even as far as Islam is concerned, that's not the promise. Now, they're promised paradise, but the idea that God is there present with them for eternity and has interaction with his creation is not the, the God of, of the Quran. And so when people say that the God of the Quran and the God of the Bible are the same, they're clearly not, uh, not only in, in their essence, what they say of their creation, how they interact with their creation, what is eternal as far as their creation, uh, two entirely different gods that are, that are shown there. And the idea that God would come here in person and give himself as a sacrifice for sin, that man could be made whole and, uh, and that man could be acceptable before God because a perfect sacrifice has been made, that is absolutely exclusive to the Bible. And there's none that even resemble that uh, in, their, in their belief system. So the God of the Bible, different distinctly from any other deity, if you want to call it that, just as a general term, that man has ever devised. 
And so even in our modern day, again, the closest that we get because it's referred to as a monotheism would be Islam. And it is absolutely different. The God of, of the Quran does not even begin to resemble the God of the Bible. They're, they're two distinctly different persons. So if people try to tell you that they're the same, they're not. They're simply not. And that's easy to, uh, to nail down by just reviewing the writings. So as far as David is concerned, as, as we uh, start to look at the text, there are some things that I want to make sure that we understand. And you've heard me say it before. I think there is a real mistake oftentimes that Bible teachers and people who are reading the Bible will, will make when they start to read through a text. That they'll read the text and if they're teaching it, uh, they will immediately go right into the context, or not to the context, but rather into the application. So no sooner do they, do they read it than they begin to immediately make an application to their life, to your life, to the world, to whatever the case may be. The, the problem is that they, they may not be even looking who, to who the original recipients were, what was the cause for the writing, what's the era of time that it was written. So much of that information that needs to be understood on the front end of whatever we read needs to be known. How do we interpret what we're seeing there? How do we understand tenses of verbs and the study aspect of it before we ever get to the point of saying, great, what does it mean to us? With David... It's a little different here in these Psalms and this one in particular that we're really kind of not given any of the historical background. We have some big general picture things. David's writing these things. David was the king of Israel. There's a few of those kind of things that we can get. But since there's not a lot that is given as far as the frame of reference of why he would write these things, remember his topic is his thankfulness to God for the writing of God's word and for how he is going to interact with the God who has communicated these things to him. So it is with just minimal background that we would have other than who he is, when he lived, and what was available to him as far as God's direction. Those things we can know, those are very big picture. But as far as the, the, the maybe events that might have been kind of prompting him to say the things that he does, we have no reference for it. So we're much more able to go directly to a, a, a way of kind of making application to what we're reading here. So it's with that that we want to be able to say, we can read this verse by verse and instantly, almost instantly, just say, how does this apply to me? And how do I read this given the world that I live in? Again, separated from David's time by 3,000 years. So that's an important thing for us to remember again, because our understanding of God dealing graciously with us looks different to us being believers in Jesus Christ, as opposed to David, who still had Jesus a thousand years into his future. He knew elements of it. He knew promises. He knew that there would be a day when God would be able to reconcile man. It was, it was foreign to him how that could be done on a permanent level, but he understood that God would give to man a way that they could be cleansed of sin, but it was just never a permanent solution. David knew that that had to be there eventually. There would have to sometime, someday, be a forever way that man could be reconciled. So David knows those things. We understand them entirely different as believers. So it's with that in mind that we start to read through these things and we're able to make application pretty much readily right away. So verse 17, let's take a look at our text and we'll start to go through this um, and uh, kind of break down some of the words once again. Synonyms are helpful in our understanding as we read through these things. So when he says, Lord, deal bountifully with your servant. And the, the idea of bountiful is, you know, to show favor, to show goodness. And David wouldn't have any reason to think otherwise because God promised that he would do that. If the people walked with him, and again, look through the law. This is what God would have said. If, you, if you're obedient to the things that I tell you to do, if you walk in accordance with what I've commanded you to do, there will be fellowship. And you will not be distant from me. I will not be distant from you. That is covered in in vivid detail and when man falls and when man fails and goes into places of unbelief and all the rest god gives remedy for that 
the sacrificial system, the offerings, all of those things, the administration of the priesthood, all of that was put in place that God could say to man, when you fail, you can be reconciled. I've put in motion and in place a mechanism by which you can be brought back. So David says, deal bountifully uh, with me due to, you know, it's basically showing good, showing favor. Allow my life to be of such a way that I am able, as he says, the second part of it, that I may keep your word. And so the idea of keeping, it's in the sense of being obedient and it's seeking God for, for guidance. And so once again, God, would you show me favor? And that idea that I, can I walk in a place of integrity before you so that I might be able to keep and to hold, to, uh, to make possession, I guess you could say, of your word. That means not just to, in a cursory way to know it, but rather to live it. And so this is what David is asking for. It's just again, show me favor that I can keep your word. Do those things which are necessary. So he says then, this part I really love, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Now, the law is the Torah. And so he's asking that God would open his eyes to it. Now that would mean that the, the, not, the common man, their eyes would be closed to such things. I understand this from my own upbringing as a, as a person that knew about who God was just by tradition and by the church that I was a part of. But the idea that, it was, that God was personal and that he revealed things to us, that he was able to open our eyes to things, this simply means revealing to us. So when David talks about this versus what we understand, it's a whole different world. Now, again, would David be able to ask something like this and not have God answer it? Of course not. God's going to say the person that's going to diligently seek after me or, or you know, put themselves to the, the looking into my word and wanting to live accordingly, God throughout the ages will always make good on that, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament alike. So for us as well, for us, could we actually say this and should we say this? Do we say this? God, when I come to your word, would you open my eyes? Because I want to see wondrous things from your law. So I don't want it to just be some cursory reading through some kind of a text and as though it's some kind of motivational thing or how-to manual. What I'd rather be able to see is what the rest of the world doesn't see. I want to be able to see what, what only the believer sees. And really in the New Testament sense, that's something that we're promised will be the case if we, if we have this reliance and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. He's the one that Jesus said, he will open your eyes to these things. He will make these things understandable. Just as Jesus did at, at various times when he was you know, moving among his, his uh, uh, apostles. There were things that he would say that they didn't grasp, and then he would open their eyes. He would give them understanding. Great example of it, one of the favorite ones that I have. Look at the two guys in a, a, on the road to Emmaus, the day of Jesus' resurrection. All that they're thinking is that Jesus is dead, and he comes alongside them on the road. So he says, you know, guys, I'll paraphrase, why the long face? And so they said, well, you're the only person here that hasn't heard about what's happened. <laughs> I almost pictured Jesus as saying, really do tell, you know? So he, he ends up, they end up saying Jesus, who, you know, did these mighty things, was put to death. And, you know, here it is, it's third day since, and, and they give him the whole lowdown of the whole thing. So it tells us that Jesus starts to give them a bit of a history lesson. And at the end of it, it says their eyes were open and he vanishes from their sight. So they went from a place of ignorance and not understanding. And Jesus told them, hey, remember what the disciples were told. We're going to Jerusalem before the crucifixion, before his arrest. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be delivered into the hands of the Jews, ultimately to the Gentiles. I'll be put to death, but raised on the third day. He told them the whole program, but they forgot. So these disciples, even the closest to him, the apostles even failed in that. And he told them that they would, by the way. So once again, the idea that God can take something that's just words on a page and open our eyes to it. What does it mean? Why does it matter? How can we live this? All of those kind of questions can not only be asked, but also answered. Because again, God speaks, he hears, he answers, he guides, he, com he comforts. Those things that I mentioned at the beginning of, of, uh, of our study here. So... Because of that, we can walk in a place of just having confidence. We can be blessed and thankful for what he does by opening our eyes to these things. He's the one who has made us acceptable in Jesus. 
because of what Jesus has done for us. So again, when I read these things, I say there's the world that David lived in, and then there's the world that we live in as believers. We have the added benefit of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, who opens our eyes to these truths. Now we know that there's a permanent solution for sin. We know that Jesus not only paid that price, but that we know him personally. He's Lord, he's Savior, he's Master. You don't say that about someone that you don't know. We as believers are supposed to be able to make him known that way, not as though he's somebody that they can read about in a book, but because we know him. And we know him because by the Spirit of God, we are indwelt by the Spirit of God, and he illuminates these things to us. So for me, um, as a personal, you know, just looking back on it, Jesus went from one point in time of being a historical figure that I knew about, and I knew his story, I knew that he died on a cross, and I knew about all that, and he resurrected, but I had no idea of why it was done, and the benefit that it is to the believer that we can know him on a personal level, and that he is the one that eventually all of us will see face to face as the one who has redeemed us. I knew none of those kind of things. So again, that's not because I figured it out in a book. That's because it's been revealed through his word by the work of the Holy Spirit, opening my eyes to these truths. So David asks for that. We should really understand how much that has progressed from David's time and think of all that has been revealed. If all you think about is David being able to take the five books of the, of the Bible, think about every bit of history that happened through the rest of the Old Testament, and then, boy, oh boy, does it change once Jesus steps into the picture, and then we have this understanding of what he did and the creation of the church, what we live in now. So, back to Psalms. Verse 19 says this. Oh boy, do I identify with this. I am a stranger in the earth, so do not, and I, you could say, so do not hide your commandments from me. So again, commandments interchangeably. You could say word, law, if you're David. Uh, you could say judgments, uh, testimony, statutes, precepts. He's going to, he's got a bunch of different ways that he, he describes how God communicates. So for us too, think about this. I'm a stranger. Now that just means a sojourner, a person who is just passing through. So a, a stranger, a sojourner, a person just passing through, think of it as a, a person who's going from one place to another and you come to a town. You're not staying there, you're just passing through. You're going to hit the border of it on one side and then as you leave it, you're gonna hit the other border but you're on to a different destination. Ultimately, you know where you're going. So David here would say, I'm a sojourner here on this earth. So from the time of his birth, he's only here for a time, but this is not the final destination. So I totally identify with where David is going here, but notice the second element of this. As a sojourner, not knowing where this place is or not identifying with it, what I do need is for the time that I am here, I have to be able to navigate on my way to my final destination. And so he says that, open, or I'm sorry, not open my eyes, verse 19, I'm a stranger in the earth. A straightforward statement of fact, and I think every Christian should understand that this is the same case for us. We are to live in this world, we're to engage it, we're to be involved and all that stuff, but this is not our forever home. We want to have a light touch on it. So I want to say the same thing. I'm a stranger on this earth. As a result of that, or because that's a truth, then I'm asking that you not hide or, or, or keep it from me. What are your commandments? So Commandments, again, just direction, um, the idea of, um, uh, of directives, you know, things that God would ask us to do. And again, the idea of not hiding uh, him, don't, don't conceal these things, which again, it's, it's such a, a comfort for us to know that in a world that we do not belong, we don't have to worry that God will leave us without information. So he doesn't hide anything from us. In fact, God is so careful to make known to us, everything is open wide for us to know. So then verse 20 says, now my soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. And that's just the crushing that we feel, that yearning, that desire we want to, to um, have a longing for, in this case, he says your judgments, that's the judicial kind of a thought. But again, interchangeable. You could say law, you could say word, you could say commandments. He uses judgments here. The idea that God, you would you would hand down to us those things that we should know and that this longing that he has, it's this crushing, it's the breaking of the soul and not in the, the way of being damaged, 
but rather it's that yearning that's there. It's that desire, that burning passion to know what God would have him to do at all times, not just when it's convenient, not just whenever, but at all times. It would just be a, a way of life as far as he's concerned. So an observation that he makes in verse 21, if you've noticed everything to this point has been on a personal level. Lord, would you do this? I long for, open my eyes. Those things that he has said, they're very personal. Now here, it's more of an observation. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, those ones who stray from your commandments. So this idea of rebuking, it just means you've rebuked. You've called people to account openly. The rebuking is when there is error, it's to be made known that there is error and uh, that, that it needs correction. So the open rebuke is something that was seen. So this is just David being able to say, as a way of looking at it historically, you have, it, now the, the it says you rebuke, but the, the tense of it is that you have in past times. And again, you'll do it now. Currently, you will continue to do it. So it all works that way. You have rebuked in the, in the past, and here we are, you know, separated from David's writing 3,000 years, we could say, yeah, David's time, God would rebuke people openly. He did it going forward through the time of, of uh, the nation, all the way through the church, and he still does so today. And so the, the word has that ability to expose and, and to make people know the things that they have done. God will sometimes, by his word, openly rebuke us. When we read things, we just go, man, I'm in violation of this. And God will call that out. Sometimes he would do it through prophets. Sometimes he would do it and, and it was just made known to everyone. Sometimes it's on a personal level. So you rebuke those who are proud. And uh, the proud just means the presumptuous, the people that don't think that they need anything uh, in the way of input as far as God is concerned. And the people that are cursed are those that are marked for judgment. Now, why are they marked for judgment? It's because they have strayed. And the straying from is the straying from your word, the, the things that are communicated, the commandments. And it's done of that straying. It means that they've been moved to error. And notice that this doesn't happen all on its own. These are things that people have done of their own will and volition. David is going to say, and a little bit later on here, that he has made it his decision to follow God. He has chosen to do this. So this here, the same thing. God's not going to rebuke something of someone for something that they've done without any kind of knowledge in this. He may give, he'll give correction. But the idea of rebuke means that this is a person who is knowingly and willingly abandon what they should have done. And so God is going to say that person is marked for judgment. They're cursed. And he's he's openly rebuked them, but they have of their own volition and will erred. They've moved into that place. They have strayed. So uh, it's not a matter of being lost. Straying is a different thing. It's willful. It means that they have gone and done those things of their own mind. So he goes on in verse 22, remove from me reproach and contempt Again, the implication here is there are people who would hurl those things at him, which verse 23 also talks about. But the idea of reproach and reproaching just means it's a scorn. People look up at him with, with detesting. They're taunting. So in this case, he says, remove from me. And that removing is kind of like a stone being rolled away. Take it from my account. Remove it from me. So he says, remove from me reproach and contempt, these people who have just real hatred for him. And here's why. For I have kept your testimonies. So there are people who hate him for, for unknown causes. And so the idea of ridicule and scorn and taunt and contempt. And he says, I'm asking that you would do this. Remove for me because I have kept your testimonies. Now, there's two ways that this has been looked at. Uh, is the reason for the reproach and contempt because David has kept God's testimonies or, or been obedient to God's word? Or is he saying, because I have been, um, I have been, uh, I've kept or held to myself your testimonies, therefore remove from me these things of taunt, means don't let them find a home. The things that these people have said and the contempt of the things that are hurled against him, let them find no meaning. And again, you can find for any of those possibilities, you can find those being played out in other places that David talks about. So there are times when he will say, 
the the people that that have come against him, uh, God that or that that God would uh, reveal them for their own hypocrisy and let them be found to be the liars, those who were his accusers. And so again, maybe done for the reason of God that your word would be seen, rebuke them openly, show them the ones who have all of these these insults, these taunts, this contempt, this hatred, this you know real desire to see David brought down that rather it would happen to them because of their motives being so evil. Then we get to verse 23. Now, princes, and when you get to princes, we think the the nobles, those that are great, those that are powerful. We know that he had plenty of these kind of people through the other Psalms and through the, the kings. When we start to study through those books where either Samuel or, or kings, um, even chronicles, you'll find those times when David had those people that would array themselves against him and they had all kinds of horrible motivations, but these were the, the the powerful, the people with lots of power, lots of ability. So princes also sit and they speak against me, but by contrast, your servant meditates on your statutes. And so the things that God has communicated, that idea of meditation is not some mindless thing as we've already looked at uh, in, in the previous weeks, the meditation and the contemplation that he mentions, I believe it was in the first week that we looked at, is very active. It's mindful. It's being completely aware and completely open to what God is doing, not trying to alter your states, as some in the church do, and it's very Eastern in its, or, in its orientation. Notice the context that David says this. Princes, they sit and they speak against me. These people in powerful places act as though they're judge, and they speak against him. However, by contrast, your servant meditates on your statutes. So they can say, they can do, they can make whatever accusations they want, but regardless of what's being said, David, in his own defense, says, but I meditate. That means to consider. I work it through in my mind. I don't want to just check out and not understand, but I will read what you have written here, God, and I'll work through it with understanding, that, that applying knowledge and the wisdom that, be, that can be gleaned from God's word, but not in a cursory sense. He really applies himself to it. Again, think about how we want to apply such words and, and such principles as we read them. We want to be actively involved in our own walk with God in these same ways. Now, your testimonies. Again, testimonies is used here. It could be statutes. It could be commandments. It could be judgments, law, word. Those are already been. Those have already been used in this uh, in this section. So he says, um, your testimonies, those things that you communicated, your word, whatever you want to say, your testimonies also are my delight. And I love this because the delight, he finds pleasure. He finds joy. He finds enjoyment by reading his word. Now, there are times, and David says it in other Psalms, he'll come across something and God communicates such a thing and he's convicted by those things. And it brings him to the place of crying out to God and saying, your word is just, it's explained to me what I've done is wrong. And so there is that recognition and crying out to God. And even in a time like that, are we not still ultimately delighted and find find joy in the fact that God would communicate to us that we could not only be confronted on things that we do, but that we could also find peace with him by correction and that we wouldn't fall into those things again. And then there are those other times you will read things and oh, they just bring such joy to your heart. So either way, we should be able to look at God's word and say, even if it's in a place of correction, how thankful I am, I'm joyful in the fact that God communicates because he's giving me the ability to see that what I might be doing would would really kind of be harmful to my relationship with him. But since he's made it aware to me, I can take the corrective measures that he points out to me in his word and I can be reconciled. Yeah, that's a joyous thing. It's something for which we should be grateful. And then he says, uh, and your, your testimonies, the things that are written in your word, they are my delight. I find joy and pleasure in them. And they are also my counselors. They're the ones who advise me. They lead me along the way. So again, when you read these verse by verse, making immediate straight application to us here and now, I think any of us would be able to say amen to each one of these verses here, that we understand them either as direct application to us, or maybe when we observe them in the world around us, like when he talks about those people uh, that are rebellious, that need the rebuke, like the people in verse 21. It's observable. We see it in the world around us. Now, in the next one that we go through, 
found in verses 25 to 32. This is the uh, uh, the letter Daleth. And so again, if you look out on the right side, you can, like you had on the last one, each one of the, uh, um, the verses, 25 through 32, begins with that letter that you see, Daleth, that's out on the left-hand side of this, uh, what, what you see up on the screen. So it's, uh, let's just read the, the actual verses. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate upon your wondrous works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. Um, o Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge uh, my heart. Now, once again, he's using the, uh, the, uh, the the letter of that alphabet as the first letter in each one of these verses. And then when, when you look across the page, each one of these, you can find where that, that uh, word would be in the English because it's not arranged the same way. Again, Hebrew is written from right to left. And sometimes we phrase things different in English than they would have phrased them in Hebrew. So you can see, actually, if you read the English translation under each of those from the blue into the purple on the right-hand side of the column, you can see how it would actually be read as far as just the straight across translation from Hebrew, we just phrase things differently in English. And I'll leave this up as we go through it. So in verse 25, he says, my soul clings to the dust, revive me according to your word. And this is the, the recognition you find David uses this kind of imagery quite often, but it's that place of I'm being brought even to the brink of death. And then that praying or asking God that he would revive uh, him according to your word, or that it's in agreement as you have promised that you would do. So even when he finds himself at his lowest state and that idea that my, my soul, everything about me, it just clings to the idea of the dust. I'm just brought so low. And the idea that God would, um, uh, would raise him up. It's just like that. Give me the ability, make me to stand, which is just great. But again, it's in accordance to, uh, to the, the things that God has promised that since he says it's a, in accordance with your word, that means that God has shown him what his word is. And he's able to know what that is, that God's intent is to make him whole, to, to uh, heal him or bring him from that place. So once again, we make application of this. Do we find ourselves at a place where clings to the dust? We just feel like we're brought so low and then we can ask, God, would you revive me according to, or because you have promised to do so in your word? So that idea of feeling broken by whatever is happening, circumstances, whatever is going on in the world has just beaten us down and brought us to that place where we are just broken. Can we cry out to God and say, revive me, bring me back to my feet, even though the world has beaten me down, can I be brought back? And this is what David is asking once again, the church, it's great to read through these things and say, what's the straight across application that we have? What will we know? So, and how can we act accordingly? So he says in verse 26, I have declared my ways and you have answered me. So as a result of that, teach me your statutes. Again, love the, the phrasing of this. The idea that he's declared his ways, it means that I've, I've made these things known to you. I've recounted to you, as he says, I've declared my ways. And it's not as though God doesn't know these things. But this is where David, and you find him doing this constantly in through the Psalms, where he just acknowledges good and bad, everything that he has done, and uh, asks that God would, as he knows, keeping record of those things, he makes them known. He recounts them. He sends them up, as, as you will, directly to God and says, look upon these things. Whether it's the taunts and the threats of people, whether it's the good and favorable things that he recounts, or his own failings, all of those kind of things. You'll find them all throughout the Psalms, examples of all of those things. So with that in mind, we could do the same thing. Lord, as I would recount to you or, or make or declare these things, my ways, the things that have, have taken place in my life, he says this, I've declared these things. Now, remember when I first started this thing, it's not only a God who hears, but it's a God who, um, who since he has spoken, um, we already have his word and it means we can cry out to him and that he not only hears, but he answers. And so again, the, the, um, 
the resulting effect of that is that we get guidance from him. We can get comfort from him. So David, along those same lines, says, I've declared, I've made known to you, and in result of that, you've answered me. So they don't just go up to the, you know, we don't just throw our prayers up there to the ceiling and nothing happens. It's not only have you heard, but you also answer. And so he says, since you answer, Lord, would you teach me? And so the teaching is with the intent to learn. It's not just saying, God, I want to learn something and then just tuning out and not even listening for him to give direction. So for us in the church, boy, does this take on a whole different meaning. Think of everything that David knew, we also know. Everything that was written to him that he keeps talking about here is written for us as well. We have that record preserved. And then, as I've said earlier, think about everything that's been added to it that we have. And then think everything that we have in the New Testament as well. So, God, when we cry out, we make known to you, we've recounted the things. Here's what my life is all about. God, you know it, you see it, but I acknowledge it. I put these things out there. And then he answers us by the the idea that he has his word, that he will instruct us. And again, if it's a way of just giving us comfort and saying what you're doing is acceptable and right and so here's the word and it will affirm that for you or what you've done may may very well be outside of what is acceptable to me great here's my word this will not only identify what it is but that it will also teach you to go forward takes a couple of things the recognition that god has made available to us instruction and a teacher the holy spirit but it also means the person that's there has to also be teachable so again for us in the church Big, big question. God's given us everything that we need. Everything is written, and we also have a teacher, the Holy Spirit, who can lead us in all understanding. Question is, are we willing to be the student? So are we being teachable? And again, the teaching is coming from, as David says, says, your statutes. And again, doesn't mean that only statutes instruct, because again, these can mean so many different things. Most importantly, we want to say, is it your word? Is it your law? Is it, what is it? How you communicate? That's the big picture. How has God communicated and how can we know? Well, great. Teach me the things that you have given to me that I may know. Statutes, testimonies, commandments, the law, your word, whatever you want to use, however you want to try to describe the fact that God has communicated. So, He says in verse 27, make me to understand the way of your precepts, and so I shall meditate on all of your wonderful works. Verse 27 is where he says that, um, make me to understand, and that's the idea of help me to understand the cause, help me to discern, and it's like, help me to, to take heed to these things. So when he says, make me to understand, help me to take heed to your precepts, and precepts are just principles. You can even call them rules, directives, whatever you want to. Again, these are things that God spells out in his word. I would have you to do this. This is acceptable to me. This is what I'm asking you to do. And so he will give those list of things. They're found all throughout the text. But once again, in the big picture, it's the idea that God has communicated these things. But it's it's one thing if they're just there, but it's the, would you help me to understand these things? And remembering that understanding uh, really comes from wisdom and knowledge. There's a reason why God would say these things. So if we're going to try to put this in practice, let's just say we read this, God, make me to understand your ways or uh, the way of your precepts. Where do they lead? What are they trying to get me to come to do? That's where we as the believers would say, okay, here's what your word says. Not only do I need you to open my eyes to it that I'd understand it, but I also need to lean upon the equipping and the, the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, that I could walk in the ways that you have laid out in your precepts. In order to do that, notice the second part of verse 27, so I will meditate on your wonderful works. What have you done? And so the the wonderful works, those things that you have already accomplished, the things that we can see because history will tell us that. They're magnificent, they're surpassing, they're grand. So help me to be thinking upon those things because you are able to be known. You have demonstrated these things. As a result of that, help me to understand how to walk in those truths. How can I, how can I walk in such a way that employs and applies all the things that you have put before me? Verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness. And so here's the request, strengthen me according to your word. Now, the idea of his soul melts, when when he says my soul, it doesn't mean just my intellect, 
doesn't mean just my heart, my head. It's everything that makes him who he is. It's all of the above. The, the total of his being, it says here, melts from heaviness. Now, he doesn't identify what the heaviness is. And again, it's that um, there's grief and sorrow, but we don't know what it is. We know from his life there are a lot of options here. And whether David thinks of any of these in particular, or he's just saying them in the most general sense that whenever things happen like that, he would say that my soul melts. And the melting is, if you think about wax, um, and there's a flame to it, and it melts, and of course, there's drops that come from it. And that's really what's being meant here. It's like that idea of weeping and the tears that fall, that melting. So he says, my soul melts from heaviness, whatever that may be. And then he asks that God would strengthen him. So again, very similar to what we saw in verse 25, when you're clinging to the dust, cause me to stand or strengthen me, cause me to arise, strengthen me. And again, because you've promised it's in accordance or in agreement with your word. So when we find ourselves at our lowest state and broken and melting, if you will, grief and the the you know crying of tears, the drops that, that follow in those times, then we can look to God and say, would you strengthen me? Help me to stand on my feet again. You know, cause me to arise. And that's always done because we can come to his word and be reassured of things. This is where we find our strength. This is where God gives us our ability to stand yet again. Again, because he's communicated these things. That's why the person who hears him, as I mentioned before, we can be blessed. We can be made whole realizing that we are accepted by God, which brings again, thankfulness, gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. So in um, verse 29, we read, remove me from the way of lying. And this is the, the way of life is really kind of the course. What do we do? It's, it's kind of what is the norm. And he says that way of lying and lying means more than just being dishonest. It goes beyond that, but it's deception. It's falsehood. Are there even ulterior motives that can be brought in? Yeah, potentially. He doesn't mention any of those things. But that way of lying, it's always done because it's either trying to conceal something that we've done that we're embarrassed of, or it's because we have something, we have ulterior motives. We want something we will lie in order to gain. So he says this, remove from me that way. It's a, it's a course of life. It's really man's natural tendency. What do I need to do in order to get what I want or to keep myself out of the place of trouble? The course of life is to lie, it's to deceive, it's, it's for other reasons. So he says, remove it from me and instead grant me your law graciously or show me favor. Would you favorably allow me to not only know your law but to apply it and then would you show me favor in that endeavor? So once again, what a great prayer. And it's kind of said in that way of a prayer that God has put his word there. Okay, great. We recognize that. God, you've given us your word and you've shown favor to us that you will communicate to us. Now, may I take what you've written, make proper application, and may it lead to a gracious outcome. Could it be something that, that brings about your intended uh, reason for saying it in the first place. Just awesome. Now notice this in verse 30, and uh, I know the Calvinists would not agree with this. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. Now notice that takes him to say, I know what they are, but it really does take something on behalf of the person who reads these things to make application. Now there are some in the church that tell us we don't have a choice in this, um, which is, I think, nonsense. But the idea that it is something that we are going to, to do, we're going to, God has said, here's what I expect, here's the offer, the offer is to be accepted, beginning at salvation, and then as far as our obedience going forward. So here, David, I think, has it completely right. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. And that laying before him is just kind of, it's everything is, is made straight. It's flat. He sees it because he's put it on his horizon, if you will. It's not uncertain. I know that it's there. This is what I can expect to do, and I'll walk accordingly. And I, I love it. I think we should be able to say the same things. It is a conscious decision. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. And so, again, your word, I cling to your testimonies, verse 31. Lord, do not put me to shame. So, the idea of clinging, it's the idea of holding. Whenever I read what your word has to say, I take it to myself. It's something that I embrace. 
and I hold those things to myself. So as a result of that, and I don't believe that there's any uncertainty in, in David in this. It's just, I think, wrong as far as the uh, the English is concerned. Oh, Lord, do not put me to shame. Um, it would be better probably said to say, let me not be put to shame. So how would be, or what would be the way that that would take place? How could that happen? That I would not be ashamed or put to shame. Well, then we can reverse engineer it again. Lord, help me not to be put to shame. How can I do that? Well, how about if I cling to your testimonies? The things that you've communicated to us, how about if I cling to those things and I make them the part of my life? I do those things because you've put them there. I'm obedient to them. If I'm obedient to what God has asked me to do, there is no way that I can be put to shame my life. Even if accusations come, they'll have no merit. Even by the person who is making the accusations, they're null and void by just the clear, simple evidence that's there. And then finally, in verse 32, I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart, giving him the capacity to do it. So it's it's intended to be, um, the, again, the, the second part of it is the recognition that, God, you're the one who makes this possible. The enlarging of the heart is the motivation behind it. You give me the ability to do these things that I can see what you have put before me. And it's like Paul's very, uh, very want to do this. David kind of picks up the same thing. It's like running a race. There's a course that is set before him and he wants to do so according to what God has asked him to. So it's put out there before him as a way that he should walk. And in this case, run. It's it's put there in, in the sense of like, you know, a running. It's a, it's a competition kind of a thing. The same kind of general uh, idea when, when Paul talks about running the race or a person that's in, in any kind of a competition, we we compete with the intention of winning. And so here David is, is really kind of does this long before Paul, but he pretty much says the whole thing. But r notice the, the dependency that he has on God. There's a, a race that's there. There's something that he is to run. He recognizes that. And he says, now, not only is there a race that's to be run, but I can run this race successfully because you will be the one who will give me the capacity and the ability. You enlarge my heart. And so, um, again, just really, really great things. As you read these verse by verse, I know we went through them kind of quickly. Take the time, if you'd like, to go back and read them on an individual way and say, I want to make perfect application to this. How do I live this principle? Because David's writing it that way. These are not written in any kind of a way to be, you know, um, motivational. Uh, he, he wasn't writing this for somebody to read it and then do these things. This is David pouring out his heart and asking that God would make these things possible for him as an individual. God is the one who has preserved this for the generations that all of us could say, yes, as David says, so may it be with me as well. And that's, that's what we should be uh, able to take away from this. These are the things that we can... When we read, say, God, I want to be able to, to not only read what I'm reading and seeing what it has to say, I want to be obedient to these things and see them take place just as David did. So that's, you know, kind of a, a, an interesting way that we can look at this and, and be uh, instructed on, on how God would have us uh, walk in, in a place of integrity and a place of success, I guess is a good way of putting it too. We want to walk with God in a way of integrity and in a way that is pleasing to him. So um, again, screenshot these if you didn't get a chance to. I just left them up. You can take a look at the English and the Hebrew. You can see the construction of it. You can even see the phrasing of it in the Hebrew as opposed to the English. Um, but again, we just want to be students of what we read, recognizing that David said these things, but also embracing as the church the things that God has revealed since David wrote these that make it that much easier for us to not only understand, but to apply these things to our personal walk here. Again, I think of that one. I'm a sojourner here. I am just passing through, so help me to have direction by your word as I navigate through this life. I, Of all the things we read today, that's the one that resonates with me probably more so than any of the other ones, although each one of them is just magnificent on its own. So I just really pray that, um, that you are really edified by this and built up as we read through these things, making proper application to our lives, those things that we read in the text. So we will pick up next week at uh, verse 33, and uh, we may th get through another two or even three. We'll just see how it goes. I'm not in any kind of a hurry. Hopefully you're not either. And uh, so we will pick up there next week.